It's great to be here to talk about how work also set a practical bi-level approach to resource management for SL-targeted microservices. This work is completed at Microsoft Research with my mentors and other co-authors. More and more companies are building their cloud applications with microservices. Uber, Amazon, and Netflix are among the first companies to do this. These two graphs show the um, complex microservice topology in Netflix and Twitter. A microservice application consists of many small, independent, and loosely coupled services. They work together to process a request from the client. The application I'm showing here is one of the benchmark applications we used in our evaluation. It's called Social Network. A typical microservice application like this will have a gateway, um, some stateless services, which process business logics, such as posting a message on this social network, and some stateful services like database and cache. When the user posts a message on this social network, the client sends a request to the gateway. This client request then generates a series of internal requests that traverses many different services. In typical microservice applications, there are hundreds or thousands of services, and client requests often traverses dozens of services. Different APIs have different internal dependencies. This is another API in this social network application. When a user wants to view another user's timeline, the client calls a different API, which is a little simpler. It involves only two stateless services and four stateful services. All these services' performance affects the end-to-end -end latency. If we allocate insufficient CPU to the services, for example, we allocate one call for each service, they may perform very slowly, resulting in an end-to-end -end latency, um, for example, 800 milliseconds. In the meantime, Typical applications will have an SLO, which means a service level objective. 800 milliseconds will be a lot higher than the SLO. This is called an SLO violation. SLO violations vastly degrade user experience. It's important to avoid under allocation and such high latencies. However, if we over allocate CPU resources, for example, we allocate eight calls to each service. Their individual latencies may be a lot lower, and we may get a 50 milliseconds end-to-end latency as a result. Uh, while we can avoid SL violations in this way, we may be actually wasting lots of CPU resources. Currently, um, many clusters in the production environments are over-allocating lots of resources in order to avoid SL violations. Some estimations show that these production clusters often have very low CPU utilization. So we believe that if we could find a practical solution to manage the resource allocation, we can save lots of CPU resources. So the problem is, how do we allocate the right amount of CPU? For each service, we want to individually set its CPU allocation. So we can set different CPU allocation for different services and we want to use the minimum total CPU allocation to achieve the SLO. Mm. This, problem, this problem is difficult, mainly because one, um, each service requires a different allocation at each time step, so the search space grows exponentially with the number of services. And two, the mapping from CPU allocations to end-to-end -end latency is unclear. Different API has different service dependency and results in different mapping. An existing approach is to manage the resource allocation on the service level. An example is Kubernetes default heuristics. It runs an allocation algorithm on each individual service. You need to set a parameter for the algorithm, the target CPU utilization. Let's say we set it at 50%. Then it observes the CPU usage as the input. If the service is currently using two CPU cores, then the CPU allocation will be set to four CPU cores in order to achieve the 50% CPU utilization target. This heuristic is simple, so it has very low overhead and can react very fast. 
However, because the allocation algorithm runs on each individual service, it can only see local data. It does not have global visibility like request per second or RPIs and end-to-end -end latencies. Another existing approach is to manage the resource allocation on the application level. An example is Siman. It runs a machine learning based allocation server for the entire application. So it knows the SLO, it knows RPS and latency information from the gateway. It also collects every service's CPU usage to learn the relationship between the services. This global visibility is great. But collecting data from every service means there will be some delay, making it less responsive to workload changes. Also, its machine learning model requires collecting training data from the production system, which is unsafe and costly. Every time we add a new service or change some service dependencies, we may need to retrain the uh, machine learning model, so the overhead is very high. It seems like the service level approach and the application level approach both have pros and cons. So naturally, we have to ask if it's possible to obtain the best of both worlds. We need low overhead and fast reaction, but we also want to utilize the global visibility to manage SLO. So what we are proposing is a bi-level approach to resource management, where we combine service level control with application level control. Our solution has both local and global controllers. The local controllers run simple heuristics on each service and use locally available metrics to perform CPU allocation, so it will have low overhead and faster reaction. The global controller runs at the application level with global visibility, such as RPS, end-to-end -end latencies, and SL violations. The interface that bridges these two levels is called performance target. The global controller will periodically determine performance targets for each service. The local controllers need to achieve their own performance targets. This is a rather simple task, so, so they can remain autonomous doing this. Our implementation of this bi-level approach is called auto-throttle. Each service has a local controller called captain to quickly adjust the CPU allocation. On the, on, the allocation. on the application level, there is one global controller called Tower to monitor RPS, end-to-end latencies, and uh, SL violations. It tries to minimize the total CPU allocation while maintaining SLO. We choose to use throttle ratio as the performance target. Tower will periodically give each captain a throttle ratio target. Now I will talk about each component in this system. First, the interface between the two levels. Throttle ratio is a metric that's related to CPU scheduling. I will show you how it's defined and calculated. The CPU scheduler works by dividing the time into individual periods. By default, one period is 100 milliseconds. In each period, the service gets a certain amount of CPU allocation. In this example, the service received one request in the first period, and it used some CPU allocation to process the request. When the next period begins, the remaining CPU is reset. After processing two requests, the service used all its CPU allocation in this period. So when the next request comes, there is no remaining CPU allocation. This request has to wait until the third period. When the third period begins, the remaining CPU is reset again, and the request can finally be processed. So this request had a higher latency due to waiting for the CPU. When a service used, used all its CPU allocation in one period, and it has to wait for the next period, we call it a throttle. In this example, there are three periods. The second period has the throttle, and the other two periods had no throttles in it. So the throttle ratio is one third. Throttle ratio is the readily available metric in today's CPU um, schedulers, such as Linux CFS. Also, we choose to use throttle ratios because our experiment shows that throttle ratio has a higher correlation with end-to-end -end latency than CPU utilization. For this graph, um, on the horizontal axis, there are six different services in the social network application. 
We adjusted the CPU allocation for these different services and measured their throttle ratio, CPU utilization, and the end-to-end -end latency. The vertical axis is the Pearson co coefficient with end-to-end -end latency. The blue bars show the correlation between throttle ratio and end-to-end -end latency. The red bars show the correlation between utilization and end-to-end -end latency. So in all these experiments, throttle ratio is shown to have a higher correlation with end-to-end -end latency than CPU utilization. A higher correlation with end-to-end -end latency gives us a better indication of the service performance. So we choose to use throttle ratio as the interface between the two levels. Now for the service level controller, we design captains. We want to make sure captains are fast and lightweight, so they use closed loop control to achieve the throttle ratio target. It collects data every 100 milliseconds and adjusts CPU allocation every second. For example, this is the CPU usage history. When the CPU allocation is low, there will be throttles. Captain monitors the throttle ratio. If the throttle ratio is higher than the target, um, Captain will scale up. If the CPU allocation is higher than the max CPU usage, Captain will scale down to the max CPU usage plus a small value to have some buffer. The calculation of this buffer is important to Captain's algorithm and is rather tricky, so please refer to our paper for more details. Finally, for the application level controller, we have Tower. Tower needs to determine the best throttle ratio targets for current APIs. We choose to use contextual bandit algorithm to learn the mapping between throttle ratio targets and end-to-end -end latencies. The contextual bandit algorithm is a very lightweight online learning algorithm. In each step, it takes an action in a given context and gets a cost as a result. It learns from historical data to minimize the cost. Our, our tower runs one step per minute, and each step takes about uh, 100 milliseconds, so the overhead is very low. In each step, tower uses the RPIs as the context and chooses an action. The action contains all the performance targets for captains. After using these performance targets, tower will collect the resulting total CPU, util total CPU allocation and end-to-end -end latency. Then Tower will calculate the cost with total CPU allocation, end-to-end -end latency, and SLO. The contextual bandit algorithm will learn from all historical context actions and costs. We design Tower to be an online learning algorithm, which means it does not require offline training. Um, so we do not need to collect lots of training data offline. In the evaluation, our test bed consists of five Azure VMs with 160 CPU cores in total. These are the four workload traces we used. We try to capture some patterns commonly observed in production environments, such as Puffer streaming requests, Google's cluster usage, and Twitter's tweets. And these are the three benchmark applications we used. In this talk, I will focus on social network. This graph shows the result of, uh, results on social network. For each workload trace, we compare the CPU allocation of autostrato and two baselines, Kubernetes, default heuristics, and Sunan. All of them can meet the end-to-end -end latency SLO, so this graph only shows CPU allocation. You can see that autostrato always allocates less CPU than the two baselines. Kubernetes algorithm over-allocates up to 35% CPU. One of the reasons is that Kubernetes algorithm is maintaining the same CPU utilization target for all services. Sunan allocates even more CPU. It tries to set a different CPU allocation for each service, but doing so means the search space will be too large to effectively explore. A large-scale evaluation shows similar, similar results. In this evaluation, we used a, a 512 core cluster and social network application. We had to actually replicate some services in social network in order to utilize, utilize more CPU cores. You can see that Autostrato always allocates less CPU than Kubernetes algorithm, which over allocates up to 39% CPU. We also performed a long-term evaluation with the 21-day real-world workload trace. This graph shows the 99% latencies in each hour. Since Autostrato uses online learning, we do not need any offline training, so we started with no data at all and did some exploration of the action space on the first day. 
On the other hand, Kubernetes algorithm requires manual parameter tuning, so we replayed the first day multiple times, and we tried different parameters. Uh, we used the best performing parameter for the following uh, 20 days. We, uh, the, the remaining 20 days are evaluated normally. This line marks the SLO in this evaluation, which is 200 milliseconds. During these 20 days, Kubernetes algorithm violated SLO in 71 of 480 hours. This graph shows CPU allocation in each hour. The red boxes mark the hours in which Kubernetes algorithm violated the SLO. It shows that Autostraddle saves an average of 12 calls and up to 35 calls. Autostraddle achieves better results because Tower uses its global visibility to monitor end-to-end -end latency, so it can choose the best throttle ratio targets to avoid SL violations. Throttle ratio has a higher correlation with end-to-end -end latency, so it provides a better indication of the service performance. And captains use locally available metrics to achieve their throttle ratio targets with low overhead and faster reaction. In conclusion, Autostraddle is a bi-level learning-assisted resource management framework for SLO-targeted microservices. Captains work on the service level and use closed-loop control to quickly adjust the CPU allocation. Tower works on the application allocation. Tower works on the application level and uses the contextual bandit algorithm to determine the best performance targets for captains. We choose to use throttle ratio as the performance target. Tower will periodically give each captain a throttle ratio target. Results show that auto throttle saves up to 26% CPU resources while sat satisfying SLO, and we have open sourced our code base. Thanks. Now I'm happy to take questions.